In the second part of this lab, students are going to learn about human genetic disorders that are caused by faulty alleles for particular genes. So earlier, we learned about conditions that can result when individuals have extra chromosomes or are missing chromosomes, right? So one too many or one too few chromosomes and what types of conditions can result because of non-disjunction. Now we're switching gears and we're talking about genetic disorders caused by faulty alleles for particular genes. Um, what that means is when you have a faulty gene, um, the DNA segments don't code for functional proteins, and that leads to some sort of a homeostatic imbalance, right? So you're basically, you're making non-functional proteins, and that leads to the cells really not being able to maintain homeostasis the way that they need to. So when it comes to um, genetic disorders with faulty, faulty um, uh, alleles, uh, we typically categorize these as either being autosomal or X-linked, depending on if the gene is found on the autosomes, again, the first 22 pairs that don't contribute to sex, or the X chromosome in regards to the sex chromosome, the 23rd pair. We're focusing on the X chromosome of the 23rd pair because every individual has to have at least one X chromosome. Now, in addition, okay, disorders can further be categorized as being dominant or recessive, depending on whether a dominant or recessive allele causes the disorder. Most genetic disorders are going to fall into one of three categories. They're going to be autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, or X-linked recessive. So I'm going to spend just a little bit of time going through each of these patterns of inheritance, okay, each of these categories. I'm going to talk to you about if someone has the condition, what genotype would they be? If they don't have the condition, what genotype types would they be? Um, we do not expect students to memorize the different conditions from the standpoint of I'll talk about Tay-Sachs or I'll talk about colorblindness. Um, you don't have to know, for example, that Tay-Sachs is a autosomal recessive disorder. But if I tell you that your patient has Tay-Sachs, I want you to know, you have to, as, a, as the student, know what that means. What is their genotype? All right. So do make sure um, that you do are able to tell me, you know, if I tell you a specific condition, um, and I tell you, again, you know, it's an autosomal dominant condition or, you know, it's an X-linked recessive condition. You need to know what that means in regards to what's an individual's genotype if they have the condition versus what's an individual's genotype if they don't have the condition. So we're going to start first by talking about autosomal recessive disorders. And these are caused by recessive alleles on the autosomes. Again, remember, those are the chromosomes that don't contribute to your sex or don't determine your sex. So an autosomal recessive uh, disorder condition um, means that if you have that type of condition, it means that you are homozygous recessive for that gene pair. So uh, disorders like Tay-Sachs, which is a neural disorder that generally uh, results in death by age five, albinism, the inability to produce melanin, cystic fibrosis, where you have thicker secretions um, in your lungs and that leads to problems with breathing. These are all autosomal recessive disorders or conditions. And so those, those individuals that are affected by those conditions, we know that they have those faulty alleles for those gene pairs. They're homozygous recessive for those specific gene pairs. Now that doesn't mean they're homozygous recessive for every gene pair in their body. Okay, just for those particular gene sets. Now, individuals that don't have those conditions are either homozygous dominant, meaning they're big R, big R, or they are heterozygous, they're big R, little r. These individuals that have these particular genotypes are not affected by those conditions, okay? They have at least one good copy, one functional copy of the allele, and they therefore they themselves don't exhibit symptoms or signs of those conditions. However, individuals that are big R, little r, that are heterozygous, we're going to refer to those as carriers. They themselves aren't affected, but they have the ability to pass that faulty allele onto their offspring. They carry the allele, but they themselves are not affected by it. So here's our two individuals, right? We've got a mom and a dad. 
both of those are carriers for a particular autosomal recessive disorder. Let's say they're both carriers for cystic fibrosis, right? So if we do the genetic cross, right, mom can either in her eggs give a, a, a functional allele or a faulty allele. Dad is the same way, right? In regards to his sperm, he can either provide a functional allele that's going to be represented by that capital letter or their upper case letter, or he can give a faulty allele, which is represented by the lowercase letter, that small c that you're seeing here. So if we look at the combinations, right, if this sperm fertilizes this egg or this sperm fertilizes this egg, this sperm fertilizes this egg or this sperm fertilizes this egg, really this gives us the probabilities of the possible outcomes in regards to the offspring that they have, right? So it's possible that 75%, again, this is just probability, right? These are, these are the possible outcomes that 75% of the children that they have would not have cystic, fib fib cystic fibrosis. 25% of the children that they have potentially could have cystic fibrosis. Now, something important to remember, right, from the probability lab is that each event is independent of the events that precede it. So sometimes what happens is people are like, oh, well, you know, I have, you know, if I have four kids, like I, three should be, you know, not have the condition. One should, you know, obviously, uh, you know, might have the condition. But the key here is that each time you do this, it's a, it's a separate event. So sometimes you could have two children and they both could have cystic fibrosis. That's just, you know, it's just the, it's, it's possible that that happens. Something to keep in mind, right? In regards to bringing probability back into thinking about genetics. But ultimately, again, the idea here is when we're doing these genetic crosses, we're talking about the possible alleles that mom could give in her eggs or the possible alleles that dad could give in his sperm. And again, the idea here is the capital letter represents, in the case of our autosomal recessive alleles, or I'm, I'm sorry, our autosomal recessive conditions, the dominant allele represents the functional allele. The lowercase letter here represents that faulty allele. Now, if we switch gears and we talk about autosomal dominant disorders, these are caused by the dominant allele on the autosome. And again, there are different examples of this. A Huntington's disease, which is deterioration of the nervous system or polydactyl, a condition that results in having extra fingers and toes, right? You don't have to memorize polydactyl is an autosomal dominant disorder. But if I tell you, you know, uh, your patient has polydactyl condition, you know, tell me what their genotype could be. I expect that that you are able to do that, right? So autosomal dominant inheritance gets, um, uh, those get passed down in regards to the dominant allele. So if you have even one dominant allele, if you are heterozygous, you have that condition, okay? So anybody that's heterozygous or, sorry, anybody that's heterozygous, big R, little r, or anybody that's homozygous dominant, big R, big R, they would show the condition. With homozygous dominant conditions, um, sorry, with autosomal dominant conditions or autosomal dominant inheritance, there are no carriers. So if you are heterozygous for that particular gene pair, you have the condition. Someone who doesn't have the condition is going to be homozygous recessive, little r, little r. So again, if we think about polydactyl, right? That having extra fingers or toes, if you do not, if you do not have that condition, your genotype is little r, little r. If you have polydactyl, you are, in regards to your genotype, either homozygous dominant, big R, big R, or heterozygous, big R, little r. Again, no carriers here. So if we have two individuals, let's say one has polydactyl, they're heterozygous, they're big N, little n. The big N represents the faulty allele. The little n represents the functioning allele, right? And then we have an individual that is homozygous recessive. This individual would not be polydactyl, does not have the condition. They have two functional alleles. Notice that 50%, again, just doing the probability, right? 50% have of the offspring would have that dominant allele and would have that you know, potentially that dominant, um, that autosomal dominant condition of polydactyl, 50% of the offspring 
are homozygous recessive, they we would not expect them to have that dominant uh, condition, that autosomal dominant condition. Last, the last pattern of inheritance are X-linked recessive disorders, and these are going to be caused by a recessive allele on the X chromosome. Again, there's lots of examples of this, uh, red green color blindness, the inability to differentiate between red and green. Hemophilia is reduced clotting ability of the blood. Um, these are examples of these X-linked uh, recessive conditions. Now, when we talk about these X-linked recessive conditions, we are going to um, take into account sex because these chromosomes are found on your sex chromosomes and they determine your sex. Again, if you have two Xs, we're, we say that you're female. If you are XY, we say that you are anatomically male. Now, females that have X-linked uh, recessive disorders are going to have two recessive alleles because they have two X's. Males, on the other hand, because they only have one X, are only going to carry one recessive allele. So you can see this little R. Notice that we're not going to put a subscript on the Y. The Y is a separate chromosome. Remember that that is, you know, it's a non-homologous chromosome to the X. So males only need one faulty allele um, to have the disorder. Females, if you are going to have a X-linked recessive disorder, you are going to carry two faulty recessive um, genes. So what does that mean? A male that does not have an X-linked uh, condition has to have a dominant allele. Females that don't have an X-linked recessive condition are going to have either two dominant alleles or one dominant allele and one recessive allele. Now, the case here with our female is that if she looks like this, if she's heterozygous, meaning she carries one good copy or one functional copy of the allele and one faulty copy, it's not a problem for her. She's not going to exhibit the disorder, but it is a problem or can be a problem for her children in that she can be a carrier. She can pass down that faulty allele to her offspring. Males, okay, when it comes to males, right, we can actually do this and look at how this is passed on as well. So here we have an unaffected father. What that means is his genotype is going to look like this. He's X big R Y, meaning he has the do, he has a dominant allele. Mother is a carrier, right? So she looks like this. She's X big R, X little R, meaning she carries that faulty allele. When we do the genetic cross, right? Dad to his son has to give a Y. Dad to his son has to give a Y, right? He's the one that passes on the Y. To his daughters, dad gives an X. He's giving an X with a functional allele in both, in both cases. Mom, on the other hand, right, she's only able to give Xs. So in this case, to one of her sons, she gives the functional X. And to the other son, she gives the X with the non-functional allele on it, meaning he's affected. To her daughters, again, this is just probability, potentially she gives a good functional allele to one daughter and she gives that non-functional allele to the other daughter. This daughter, again, is not affected herself, but she's a carrier, meaning she can pass that on to future generations. When you take into account X-linked recessive disorders, you have to take into account this, their sex. So you are going to notate genotype like you're seeing here, like I've done it. X little r, X little r, X big r, X big r, or X r, big r, X little r if it's female, big X big r, or X little r, Y when it's male. Now there are a couple of things that we can talk about, right? Males, um, are going to have, if, if you have an affected male, he had to get that affected, um, uh, that non-functional allele from his mother. Okay. So males that have hemophilia or red, green color blindness, they got that from their mom. Now it could be that their mom has the condition. 
okay? Or it may be that she's a carrier of the condition, okay? It just depends. You'd have to know mom's sort of phenotype in, in order to then figure out her genotype. If you have an affected female that have a, has an X-linked condition, she would have gotten that from both of her parents, both mom and dad. So dad would have had to have been affected. So what are you doing in regards to these defective alleles? You are going to ultimately be working on prob problems that look something like this. James was adopted and knew nothing about his parents. At the age of 30, he developed symptoms of Huntington's disease. Now, again, you can look in your lab book, and when you do that, what you will find is that Huntington's disease is an autosomal dominant disorder. Would knowing both of his birth parents have indicated he was at risk for Huntington's disease, or could they have both been healthy? Okay, well, if Huntington's disease is an autosomal dominant disorder, right, that looks like this, right, James, he has to be either big R, big R, or big R, little r in order to have the disorder, right? So he looks like this or he looks like that. Well, if that's the case, right, because he has the condition, he had to get that faulty allele from one of his parents. So it's autosomal dominant disorders cannot skip a generation. So his, if he had known his birth parents, he would know that he was at risk because one of his parents would have also have had to have Huntington's disease. They both could not have been healthy, right? They, they both could not have had functional alleles or otherwise they couldn't have given James that faulty allele. So you do need to work through all of those genetic uh, questions, those genetic problems, and if you have questions, make sure that you're reaching out to your instructor.